why are folks stuck in po poverty and what is the system systemic ways that this is happening and how can we fix it? We have a few great, let's see if I can move my screen. Sorry, all looks like I can't move it. Let me try again. Okay, not sure what's happening there, but there we go. Okay, sorry all. Hopefully you can see that. We have some great panelists tonight from the community. We have Andrea Kuick. Hopefully I said that right. She is the policy analyst for the Bell Policy Center. We have Nicole Linhart. She is with the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless as clinical program manager. And last we have Chris Stifler. He is the senior economist for Colorado Fiscal Institute. So the format that we have this evening is that our three panelists are going to share a little bit about the work that they're doing uh, and how it fits into tonight's topic about wealth inequality. And then we will open it up to questions for everyone. Um, if you can put your questions in the Q&A portion below, um, we will be monitoring those questions and save them for after. And the chat is really for um, kind of communicating amongst yourselves about the topic. We just hope that you'll keep it on topic this evening. So I will turn it over to Andrea. I'll stop sharing my screen so that she can share hers. Yeah, well, hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here in just a second. So just give me one second. Okay, so hopefully folks can see my screen. Um, so um, again, thank you so much for, for having us here. We're really excited to be part of the conversation. Um, as was just mentioned, my name is Andrea Kuick, and I'm a policy analyst with the Bell Policy Center. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about predatory lending um, in Colorado, and of course, the intersection of that with wealth inequality in our state. Uh, so to give you just a little bit of a preview about kind of how, um, what I'll be talking about, uh, I'm going to go over a little bit about what predatory lending is. Uh, so what exactly does that term mean? Um, then I'm going to go over um, a little bit of when we talk about predatory lending, we often talk about these cycles of debt and poverty that it often leads to. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and what that means, followed by uh, kind of the state of predatory lending in Colorado, and then conclude um, with some things that we can be doing as a state to really combat this. Uh, so that is a lot to cover in just a little bit of time, but before going into that, um, wanted to just provide for those who don't know um, or aren't as familiar with our work, uh, just a little bit about who we are as an organization. So again, for those who aren't as familiar, um, we are a policy advocacy research organization. We focus on issues of economic mobility throughout our state. Um, so really thinking through what are the systems, what are the structures, what can we be doing to make sure folks can get and stay ahead. Uh, so, of course, then this very much leads into, you know, why we've, you know, focused on predatory lending throughout the past, you know, 15, 20 years since we've been in existence. So moving into kind of what is predatory lending, uh, this is kind of that first kind of like base level um, kind of setting here is that when we talk about predatory lending, what we're talking about are kind of the unfair, deceptive or fraudulent lending practices. Um, so kind of breaking that down a little bit, when we talk about unfair, the things that we're often referring to are um, kind of those really incredibly high interest rates and fees. And as we'll talk about in, in just a little bit, you know, those can sometimes be upwards of 100% on, on pretty small dollar loans. So, so those are, are um, really harmful to a lot of folks. 
Moving into the other half, when we talk about some of the deceptive, or excuse me, deceptive and fraudulent practices, you know, those can take on a number of different um, kind of practices. So kind of, you know, for one of the things that we often are noticing is that a lot of times people, you know, aren't being told when they're taking out these loans about, you know, kind of what, what all of this is going to mean, how kind of the debt and everything else is going to accumulate for them. So that's one, one piece of this. You know, the other thing that we've also been seeing is that on some of these, you know, products, again, that we'll talk about in a little bit later on, you know, we um, have seen the lenders, what they'll do is that if you come in and you say, I want to take out a loan, you know, they'll offer you these kind of alternative products. And when we talk about alternative products, they'll say, you know, here's this insurance policy on this loan, but they won't tell you that um, this is a voluntary product that you need, that you don't need to take this out. Um, and so of course, then that all kind of rolls over into the total cost of the loan, et cetera, which is um, of course really problematic. You know, just kind of finishing out this slide. And again, when we talk about these products, you know, we're really talking about these subprime, you know, kind of lending market. So we're talking about people who are often in pretty economically vulnerable positions to begin with. Um, they generally have less access to traditional forms of credit. Um, they're oftentimes in these really vulnerable positions. So, you know, this then kind of gets into this next piece. When we talk about predatory lending, we often talk about these cycles of debt, which is what kind of predatory lending can, can lead to. Um, so to kind of walk through portions of the slide, I, I feel like it's, it's important to say kind of what does it look like for someone who comes in and then says they want to take out, to, take out a loan? Um, so if you come in and, and again, you're often in this, you know, more economically vulnerable position and you say, you know, I, I, I want to take out this loan, you know, you are often facing these really high fees, you are facing these really high costs for these products. And again, if you are in an economically vulnerable position, you know, you have, you know, this $500 to $1,000 loan on top of that, you're tacked on a bunch of fees, et cetera. And then of course, what we often see happening is that because the fees are so high, because the rates are so high, et cetera, you know, we often see very high rates of delinquency. We see very high rates of bankruptcy. The other thing that we also see is that we see people kind of taking out these loans again and again and again, right? So you come in and, and you wanna take out this loan, you find that you can't pay the fees and the interest rates, et cetera. And then they just kind of roll you over into another loan. Um, oftentimes we're seeing that for a lot of these folks, sometimes up to, you know, you know, the amount of loans that these lenders are giving out, about half of them can be from these kind of renewals, which all really point to the fact that people are having trouble paying back these loans on time. And so that's what we really talk about with these kind of cycles of debt. You kind of are, are vulnerable to begin with. You have trouble paying back these really high um, rates and fees on these loans. And then you just get further and further and further and further into debt. The final thing that I'll kind of conclude with here is that when we talk about the disproportionate impacts on communities of color, you know, of course, um, we see a lot of these um, lenders operating a lot more in Black and Latinx communities in Colorado. The other thing that I'll also just mention is we know that in especially in communities of color, there have been systematic lack of access to traditional forms of credit, right? So whether it's home ownership, whether it's access to traditional banks, et cetera, people have less access to these forms of credit, which again, can lead to a higher reliance on some of these other you know, high lending um, and high cost products. So I'm gonna talk for just a minute or so about kind of the current state of high cost lending in Colorado and what some of these products look like. Um, and so, you know, I think the kind of the hope that I have that people take away from kind of this slide is that when we're talking about these high cost lend lending products, it's often kind of playing a game of whack-a-mole, right? Like we, we kind of regulate one product, but then, you know, the high cost lending industry, they'll say, you know what, like we're going to create this other product that kind of is a loophole um, or we find this loophole to kind of continue to offer these really, again, high cost lending products. Um, so that's like one mole that we're kind of trying to whack. The other thing as well is that we often see is that even as we put some of these rate caps on, on some of these different products, it's kind of a constant battle to make sure that they're maintained. 
Um, so you see that in all of these different products. So for example, payday loans, if folks remember, we passed Proposition 111 uh, back in 2018. It caps payday loans at 36%. It was one of the most uh, popular ballot measures in Colorado history, which was amazing. We did great work as a state. However, since then, if you kind of look at that far right-hand column, these alternative charge loans, you know, these are another alternative, or excuse me, another high cost lending product that's kind of been popping up here in Colorado. Um, and as you can see, you know, and, and kind of that, that, that second row there, you know, total APR, which is kind of the, the total cost of a loan. So it's your interest rates and your fees. Those can be upwards of 100%. And we're seeing very high delinquency rates. And again, we have seen kind of a migration in the past year or two from payday loans to alternative charge loans. Right, so again, we see these products popping up. Um, the thing that I'll also mention in kind of that second mole there with around supervised installment loans, um, you know, these are again, are another, can be another high cost loan. We have done great work over the past, you know, 10, 15 years to cap some of the interest rates on these loans. But we have kind of constantly heard throughout that time, including more recently, that there is an interest in trying from the industry and trying to raise the total APR on these loans, right? Which is again, problematic for people. We have these protections in place for a reason. Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of finally conclude on this slide by mentioning like, this is, in, this is a, a, a nationwide effort where we have seen you know, folks across the country trying to do this, the same lenders who are trying to do this. You know, we know that our neighbor uh, to the east in Nebraska, you know, they're facing this kind of similar problem. You know, folks back on the east coast, um, to the south of us as well. So, you know, no matter what the interest rates are, no matter what the fees are, we kind of constantly hear from lenders that the that the total allowable fees and rates constantly need to be um, increased. So I'm just going to end just real quick whenever we think about what we can be doing in Colorado and just kind of running through these um, just real quick. Um, you know, we can be maintaining and expanding these rate caps, which is incredibly important. Um, especially in, again, this really game of whack-a-mole. Um, we can be expanding the product transparency, reporting, and consumer disclosures. So making sure that consumers know what they're getting themselves into. They're aware that they don't have to be purchasing certain products. Um, and also, again, additional reporting to the state is in helpful in making sure that we have kind of the best products that we can. Um, the third thing that we could be doing is really developing more affordable alternative loan products. So we know that in the subprime kind of market that there are folks who are doing this better. Um, and it's often in community institutions. We know that some nonprofits are doing this. So what can we be doing to kind of expand some of this? The fourth thing that I'll mention is really kind of creating this proactive infrastructure to help consumers build wealth and reduce debt. Um, so one of the things that we're really excited about at the Bell is this effort that we have this legislative session to create a statewide office of financial empowerment. And it's been shown um, in different ways, again, to, to build wealth in communities, reduce debt. And of course, whenever we do that, people have less of a reliance on some of these products. So the final thing, of course, that I just want to mention, just throw out there, of course, this is a very much a, a, a long-term effort. Um, but really at the root of this is a need for better wages, a need for lower costs for essential goods and services. Uh, so again, those are just a couple of things that we can be thinking about moving forward. Um, and again, just thank you so much for having me and I'm really excited to be part of this conversation tonight. So I am going to get my slides going here for you. Maybe. There we go. Sorry, I'm having a slight technical problem. I will get it going in a second. There we go. Okay, so I apologize for that. My name is Nicole Linhart. I am 
I'm a licensed professional counselor and like licensed addictions counselor. I'm currently um, the clinical program manager for our family supportive services team at um, the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. So we primarily are working with current and formerly homeless families. And what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today is how wealth and inequality affects people experiencing homelessness. Um, I would hope that some of you maybe are familiar with the poverty cycle, but I wanted to introduce that to you. Um, the poverty cycle is a concept of how um, our clients that are living in poverty just are stuck in um, a vicious cycle with their lack of education that keeps them from generation to generation in this cycle. So we look at things like hunger, poor health and living conditions, and those lead to a lack of education, which lead to a lack of opportunity, which leads to low income, which leads to continuing in this cycle, um, like I said, uh, for generations. So the first piece that we're gonna look at is food and nutrition limitations. Um, I, hopefully some of you are aware of the concept of food deserts, but what that is, is um, high density population places that have very limited access to grocery stores or places like Walmart, Target, et cetera, where you can buy food. Um, and those food deserts in the Denver metro area tend to be in our um, areas, especially in the Denver area with um, higher proportions of uh, persons of color. Um, for example, Montbello and Globeville are two of the highest areas. Um, additionally, um, unhealthy food choices tend to be cheaper. A comprehensive review of 27 studies in 10 countries found that unhealthy food is about $1.50 cheaper per day than healthy food. And when we say $1.50 cheaper per day, that's per person. So even with just a family of four, that is $6 a day and you multiply that out for a month and that's $200 a month, which is just money that our families don't have to buy the healthier food. Um, in 2018, 42% of Colorado children were eligible for free or reduced lunch. And again, the majority of those are from our communities of color. Um, one thing with COVID happening, the, my first thing, because I work with these families was, what happens to all the kids who, all the meals they get, they get breakfast and lunch at school for free. What happens to those kids with the school shut down? Thankfully, the school districts jumped on that really quick and made drop off locations or pick up locations, I should say, where people were able to pick up food, uh, meals for the day and for the weekend over the longer weekends. Um, but that was a huge concern is how these kids were gonna access food. Lastly, there's a lack of knowledge in how we prepare healthy food. Um, we primarily learn our taste in food and how to prepare food from our families of origin. And if they don't teach us how to cook or teach us how, um, what healthy food is like, then we don't, that doesn't translate for us as an adult. One example is of a family who we went in to give them some support. And when I went into their apartment, it there was a strong odor of rancid cooking oil. And it turns out that she was just cooking chicken legs in oil, frying chicken in oil every day for her kids. There wasn't um, any sign of vegetables or even like side dishes anywhere in the house. It was chicken is what they were eating every day with oil that she was recycling. Um, so an example of how that affects the families we work with. Um, we're gonna move on to clothing resources, which is something we might not think about as often. Um, families in poverty tend to buy lower quality clothing or clothing from secondhand stores. Um, this can lead to children being targeted at school because of their clothing. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, also, we see that especially the children, but all um, people in poverty tend to have dirtier clothing on that can be from a lack of money to do laundry or access to laundry facilities. Um, also being over or underdressed for the weather, I don't know about you, but I was being overly optimistic with the lovely weather we had a couple weeks ago and swapped out my winter clothes that I was tired of wearing for my summer clothes. And I've been suffering over the last two weeks, last week or so because of that. Um, 
but not suffering the same way our clients do who don't have those choices and opportunity to switch out um, their wardrobes. And next we have educational challenges. Um, poor nutrition can lead to difficulties of learning and um, or behavior problems in school. One thing we know is that um, ADHD can look a lot like poor nutrition and um, or lack of sleep, or I should say that in reverse, lack of sleep and poor nutrition can look a lot like ADHD. So sometimes we have kids that are being targeted at school as having learning disabilities um, and behavior problems, and really they just need better nutrition and um, better sleep. Lower income parents frequently lack the time and or ability to advocate for their children's education, especially our families that are holding down, our parents are holding down two or three jobs. Um, and if they miss a job to go deal with the child problem at school, they get that they're in danger of being fired. They're probably just gonna let the kids stuff at school go by the wayside and keep their job because it's that priority of providing shelter and food over um, being able to advocate. Also, a lot of them don't know how to advocate for their children or what their children's rights are. A lot of the work we do is to help support parents in knowing exactly what their rights are for their children's education. Um, lower income children are easier targets for bullying. So this is partially where the clothing piece comes in if they're not in the top designer clothes that the kids from wealthier families are in then kids know that they are different and probably poor. Also, if the kids um, are not clean themselves or their clothes are not clean, or um, the uh, free and reduced lunch are all signals to peers that these are kids that are not from as wealthy families and can make them easier targets for bullying. Additionally, the behavior problems in class also <laughs> cause problems with peers um, and make them targets for bullying. We see higher truancy levels in lower income families. This is not um, our, just our traditional kid, high school kids. I think with truancy, a lot of times we think about, uh, you know, these high school kids are just ditching class because they don't want to go and they're going to go smoke weed or whatever. But we see a lot of truancy levels in lower in the lower grades too in the elementary. Um, and this relates to one of my next slides, but um, partially because maybe parents can't get their kids to school or, um, you know, with their jobs and things like that, it, it makes it challenging. And then finally, with education, we see higher incidences of dropping out. This happens for many different reasons. I used to work with a family that had two older children that they brought with them when they immigrated from Mexico, and then they had two um, babies after they moved here, and they frequently would have the older children stay out of school to care for the younger children so the parents could work. Um, so there's some of those cultural differences in the values of education, um, which is I had to work with the parents to explain to them that in the United States, you know, this is we expect kids to be in school and there's compulsory education. We also see um, Families where the kids drop out, the oldest kid might drop out of school to get a job to help support the family. If there's a bunch of younger kids at home and their single parent income isn't cutting it to provide food or shelter. Um, also, the kids that have experienced some of these other things with being behind in school or the bullying and things might just drop out because they are um, frustrated and <laughs> feeling hopeless and don't see the point. Um, next, we're going to talk about healthcare disparities. Um, in 2016, 11.8 million Americans had a need for mental health services that were unmet. Of these, nearly 38% could not afford the cost of treatment. Moreover, only about one in five people with a substance use disorder received treatment in 2016, and only slightly more than 40% of adults with any mental illness received treatment in 2017. Now we expect that most of these families have access to Medicaid and most of them do. But one thing that doesn't get talked about is there's kind of a Medicaid cliff, Medicaid and CHP plus uh, cliff. 
So what that means is if someone is working in a job and they get offered a raise where they're going to make a dollar an hour, an hour or more, and we're thinking, great, you know, this is helping them be more self-sufficient, but that dollar an hour or more could cause them to not qualify for Medicaid or CHP plus for their kids anymore, which would mean that potentially they would want to buy into their company's insurance, but the cost of the insurance through the company most often costs more um, than that dollar an hour that the raise would give them. And so they actually end up making less without um, the benefit, which leads families if they take the more money um, with either choosing to, uh, primarily choosing to not take the company insurance which means they are um, outside of the federal mandates for insurance and at risk if there are any um, health issues or accidents that come up. Additionally, Medicaid isn't always great, especially at covering mental health and substance use stuff. It is getting better and those disparities are being addressed, but there's a long ways to go before everyone can get those needs met. Um, we also know that poverty and low income status are associated with a variety of adverse health outcomes, including shorter life expectancy, higher rates of infant mortality, and higher death rates for the 14 leading causes of death. So just in general, we know that being poor or from a lower economic status has a negative impact on health. And then the final piece that is all linked together is transportation. Um, because trans lack of transportation negatively impacts all of these things. So these are this is something that I think is often missed when we're thinking about this cycle. But you know, let's look, look back at the food deserts. There's an um, if you don't have transportation and there's a you're living in a food desert, how are you going to get the food you need for your family? Um, this affects the truancy um, in most school districts. There's a um, certain distance if you're away from the school for you to access uh, public transportation or school buses. So in my county, it's uh, a mile and a half for elementary children. If you live within a mile and a half of the school, you are not able to access school buses. I don't know about you, but I would not want my kindergartner walking a mile to school by themselves every day um, and so I might keep them home if I didn't have a way to get them there. Um, you know, transportation, you know, also affects the, again, the ability to obtain clothing or the accessing means to clean the clothing. If you've got a family of four and need to go to the laundromat and you don't have transportation to do that, it's going to be really challenging to get those clothes clean. And then finally, again, we see the difficulty in accessing adequate physical and mental health resources. Medicaid does provide transportation resources, but they are woefully inaccurate or inadequate, excuse me. Um, we have reports of clients that um, get picked up for our, uh, medical appointment an hour before the appointment and then have to wait for an hour that it's until it's over um, to get picked back up for their return trip home. So they just spent two hours waiting for nothing. And especially during COVID, most places aren't even going to just let you sit around and wait for those hours. So where are they supposed to wait? Um, I've had problems with clients that um, did the transportation just did not want to pick up. Um, I had one that was heavily um, tattooed a former gang member and they just refused to pick them up, period. Um, and even today in our office, we had a family that did not arrive for their mental health appointment because Medicaid transportation did not come and get them. So this is an ongoing problem. So just to cycle back to looking at the poverty cycle and now um, that we've run through all those things, you can kind of see the links here and how they all play into keeping these families and these kids really stuck in the um, pop, in the cycle of poverty, and it makes it very challenging to um, for them to get out. I uh, thank you for the ability to talk to you guys about this today, and I'm happy to take whatever questions you might have at the end.
Cool. As the third part of the panelists, I'm going to talk about how we can use our tax code. I'm the economist at the Colorado Fiscal Institute, and so I do a lot of tax policy analysis. So we're going to talk about how we can use the tax code, and how we can advocate for tax policies that can, can uh, help out the wealth gap and boost the wages of those in the, in the experience in some of the situations that we've talked about today, and how the current tax code can actually exacerbate what we call the upside down uh, tax code. And so I want to start the presentation talking about two different numbers, 9% and 6.6%. These numbers are on average, but some households pay in state and local taxes, what percentage of their household income they pay in state and local taxes. Some Colorado households pay 9%, some Colorado houses pay 6.6%. Okay, and we're going to talk about why that is, why does everyone pay the same percentage of their income, why do some people pay less, some people pay more, why well, if you're lower income, you're more likely to pay 9% of your income in state and local taxes. If you're a person of color, why you're more likely to be in the paying the 9% group than in the paying the 6.6% group. So that's kind of the conundrum we're starting the first this little, this little mini lecture off with. And to get there, I want to explain why we have some constitutional policy in our tax code, in our state constitution, that makes us rely on sales tax, which we'll learn why that's regressive, and makes us more rely on fees. Again, another form of revenue raising uh, mechanisms that uh, more, are more punitive to lower income folks, that take a higher percentage of household income for lower income folks than they do upper income folks. So remind you that we are, have the Taxpayer Bill of Rights in Colorado. It's a constitutional amendment we added in 1992. Very few people know what Tabor really is. If they know anything, they know that Tabor only requi requires that politicians can't raise taxes without a vote of the people. So that's part of our story. Tabor also caps what certain types of taxes we're allowed to have. To our story here, Tabor specifically caps the graduate, uh, doesn't allow us to have a graduated income tax. So most states, 34 states, have a tiered or a graduated income tax where they can tax wealth uh, more easily than we can here in Colorado. We used to have a graduated income tax. Uh, we currently have a flat. So everyone pays a flat income tax rate. Uh, Tabor also caps how big government can grow each year. And so all the fees and taxes that we collect every year, we sum all those up and then there's this cap. The cap grows by inflation plus population. So basically we've got to restrict how big each government can grow, state governments, local governments, city governments, uh, they must stay below the cap that grows by inflation plus population. The last part of the Tabor story that flows into why we have kind of an overall regressive or what we call upside down tax code is the fact that we can't raise taxes without a vote of the people, but our legislators and our elected officials can raise fees. And we'll see in a second why fees, why we have a heavy, heavy fee state. We have very high fees on, say, motor vehicles. We're kind of a pay as you play. If you can afford it, you get it kind of state. And I'll argue that a lot of that has to do with the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. So going back to how we look at why or how we say our code is upside down, what we do as, as data nerds is we basically line up everyone from the person who makes the lowest wage per hour to the person who makes the highest wage per hour. And then we cut what we call quintiles. We basically divide everyone into 20%. And then we track the spending patterns and we can predict basically what percentage of your household income do you pay in things like sales taxes, property taxes, and income taxes, what we call state and local taxes to the state of Colorado. So if you make less than 22,000, you fall into that lower 20% of wage earners. If you make between 22 and 40, you're in the next quintile. And then people who make between 40 and 65 fall into that middle quintile. Also, my blue, and then you can see I've also broken up the top quint, top earners and also the top 4%, top 1%. On top of those bars represents what we pay in state and local taxes. So basically all the sales tax, income tax, property tax divided by your income. You can see that a household making 20,000 or making 30,000 pays close to 9%, 9, 8.9%. So if you're lower income, you pay a lot higher percentage of your income in state and local taxes. Whereas you move up the income spectrum, you pay a lot lower percentage. Someone in the top 1% making more than half a million dollars pays six, on average pays 6.5% of their income in state and local taxes. As someone who's making minimum wage only pays 9%. 
And that's not to say that these millionaires aren't paying a lot of taxes. They're indeed paying a lot of taxes. It's just as a percentage of their household income, they're paying a lower percentage. And so economists use the term regressive. This downward sloping regressive nature means that lower income folks pay higher percentage than upper income folks. Here's the same quintile analysis, but I took the data and I broke it out by race. And so overall in my tax filers data, it's 75% white, 18% Latino or black taxpayers. So that's the overall breakdown, 75% white. But look at the first quintile. It's only on average 59% white and 36.4% Latino and black. So you're much more likely if you're Latino and black to fall in these lower quintiles. If you're white, you're much more likely to fall in the upper end quintile upper income quintiles. But that also means that if you're white, you're more likely to fall into the quintiles that pay a smaller percentage of your household income in state and local taxes than if you're falling into these lower quintiles that pay a higher percentage of your, of your income in state and local taxes. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that, well, one, our sales tax is really complicated. So everyone pays the 2.9% state sales tax. But depending on which city, county, RTD district, museum district, cultural district you're in, whether you're in Englewood versus Arapahoe County versus Aspen versus Gunnison, we have very high local sales taxes. And it's the sales taxes that make our tax code are one of the more regressive forms of taxation. So here's my same quintile analysis, but I've broken out just the sales tax portion, the state and local sales tax portion, you can see the, the overall nature of regressivity is really the sales tax. A minimum wage worker pays about 6% of their income in state and local in sales taxes, whereas someone earning 250,000 pays 1.4% of their household income in, in sales taxes. So that's why we say when economists talk about sales taxes being very regressive, they take a lot higher chunk of low income folks paychecks than upper income folks. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that upper income folks save more of their of their income. And then low income folks spend spend all of their money just to get by. And they tend to buy goods that are subject to sales tax. So if you buy a lawnmower, you pay sales tax. But there isn't tax sales tax on services, very many services in the state. So you pay up for a lawn mowing service, you don't pay sales tax. You buy your own lawnmower lower, you pay sales tax. And so based on the, the purchasing patterns of low income versus upper income, and the fact that upper income save a lot more of their income, sales tax are very more, a lot more punitive on lower income folks. And the same with fees. If they're flat rate fees, you know, if you're paying a $100 flat rate fee to register your car, well, $100 out of a $20,000 income is a lot higher percentage of your income than $100 for Peyton Manning, who's, you know, could maybe be making millions. Fees tend to be flat rate fees tend to be very regressive. And again, there's your, again, the same racial breakdown that we saw earlier. If you're a person of taxpayer of color, you're more likely to fall in those lower household groups that pay a lot higher percentage of your income in, in sales tax. And so there's ways to do this that can exacerbate the regressivity or improve the regressivity. We, uh, as a citizens initiative state, vote on a lot of things. Last election, we actually voted to cut our income tax rate. When, when you do broad-based measures like cut the income tax rate, you gave a lot of tax breaks to millionaires and, and the people in the top 1%. And so if you slice and dice the data, about 1% of taxpayers in Colorado make more than 500,000. They got 21% 20, uh, of the tax cut because they own, and that 1% owns about 20% of the taxable income. So when you broad basically cut the rate, you're cutting the rate on the taxable income that's mostly uh, uh, that's a lot held by the top one percent. Or look at another way: the top one percent got about the same amount of tax cut as the bottom seventy percent when we lowered the income tax last year. So broad based measures of, of cutting taxes don't help out that regressive overall nature. What do help? I'm gonna, second, I'm going to talk about what do does help. But there are better ways to do it. And so I want to quickly show you Vermont's same analysis, quintile analysis versus Colorado's. Again, Colorado's is, is that regressive where the higher income you earn, lower, lo, lower percentage of your household income you pay in state and local taxes. Vermont's is more progressive. 
And the reason why Vermont is more progressive, they have a less reliance on sales tax. They have a graduate income tax. They also have, a, and I think they have a state tax. So there are ways to tax wealth and improve our, our upside down tax code. In Colorado, we do this more through the vote. So we as voters need to vote on things. Or what we can do is use the tax code through our legislature, which there's several bills in the legislature and we've been working on for several years. And that's boosting up the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. The federal big Biden's big tax code change and stimulus made some big improvements to the, tax, to the uh, child tax credit. It's really targeted to lower income folks. And then the earned income tax credit is a way of basically boosting wages for those at the bottom using the tax code. So when you make you know, your low wage worker making between like 20 or $30,000, particularly with kids, you get even more per kid. It's a way of basically augmenting low wage work through the tax code. So there's several, you know, you can change the minimum wage, but it has big impacts, but that can also impact businesses. Another way of to boost the wages in a roundabout way is to use the tax code. And we're, we're fighting uh, to boost our, there's a federal earned income tax credit, and then the state links gives a portion, I think it was 10 or 15% of the federal. And so we'd love to boost that up and give 20% of the federal earned income tax credit through the state. So you get more money back from the state when you file your taxes, when you're in those lower income household groups, particularly with, with children. So one way to advocate this legislative session is to advocate for the bills that uh, expand the earned income tax credit and expand the child tax credit. It's just one of the ways we can use our tax code to our advantage to help boost the wages of low wage workers and also to help correct that upside down uh, tax code that we have here in Colorado. Pass it back to Jill. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Nicole and Andrea, for sharing a lot of information with us. Um, let's get through some questions. It looks like we have about 20 minutes left, and we had a lot of folks uh, submitting some questions. So thank you for doing that. Uh, and just before we leave today, we do have a call to action. So make sure you stick around till the end so we can chat about what we need you to do. Let me go up a little bit to see some of these questions. So it looks like this is probably a question for Andrea and our panelists. You can all feel free if you'd like to um, show your video again. Um, for Andrea, how can Colorado policymakers promote legitimate banking services in underserved communities? Uh, maybe something like postal banking. Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, and so, A, I will say that I'm not uh, very familiar with postal banking, but I think when we talk about, you know, some more of that traditional banking, you know, I think that there are a couple of different efforts and things that we can explore. Um, one, I mentioned this at the very end of my presentation, but there are, there are some efforts, um, and it's primarily driven by a lot of these community banks, and again, some nonprofits to offer some of these kind of loans um, and, and kind of just more underserved communities. Um, and, you know, even if we are talking about um, kind of, you know, not necessarily as traditional loans, there's still higher cost loans, you know, but they're still like, they're not at this, like even this 36% interest rate cap that we have elsewhere. So, right, like people are doing that and then they, they are, are thinking about some of these different um, options and how to do that, right? Like there are a list of best practices and it's really community driven. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks are taking that on by themselves, which I think is great. The thing that I'll just mention and kind of, um, and it connects to some of the legislation that we're running this session, uh, which I had mentioned is again, this Office of Financial Empowerment, which is a way and then to kind of connect these best practices and things that are working well in communities. Because a lot of what we have been seeing is that the financial empowerment work um, making sure people have access to some of these basic financial services, it is incredibly fragmented, even though we are seeing the same problems in, you know, the Roaring Fork Valley, as opposed to our Aurora or Commerce City, anywhere else. So that's a way to do it. The other thing that I'll mention as well, um, we also know that, um, especially in certain communities, that there is a lack of kind of banking access and the kind of your access to a bank account can kind of provide this like very um, kind of, it's like a, the next step into then being able to access some of these more traditional forms of credit. 
And so again, there are coalitions of folks in kind of a, like a, a more um, standard way to then say kind of how can we make sure people are connected to bank accounts? How can we make sure that they have access to some of these different pieces, which again, have less um, reliance on some of these other alternative products by making sure that you have access to lower cost loan, or excuse me, you have lower cost banking accounts, all right? Like no fee accounts, et cetera. So that's a very long winded way, I think of saying that there are a lot of great things that are happening. And some of it is just kind of connecting the dots and making sure that kind of all that people know what's going on and can learn from some of the best practices and really lifting up some of these, some of these different things that are happening elsewhere. Thanks, Andrea. Um, and I think we have one more question, kind of going back to the predatory loans. What percentage of these loans never get paid back? So that is also a really wonderful question. You know, and I think that that is something that we kind of struggle in part to answer because what we know, what we have seen from the data, and I, I had, I think, mentioned this as well before, is that oftentimes there isn't really good statewide data on saying so how like how it kind of like on a, on a um, disaggregated way how many people are struggling exactly to pay some of these back what we do know is that kind of on a national level um, some of the you know if we look at kind of the these these lending organizations if we look at their filings to the sec we can see that people are struggling to pay them back and we see that people are having trouble and kind of rolling these loans over. Um, so we don't have exactly good information on that. The other thing, though, that I that I will mention, um, that I will mention, and it was like right at the tip of my at the like the tip of my head, and then it just like went away. Um, you know, but but what we do know, especially whenever we say that they don't get paid back, we know that it is a practice of these lending organizations or these lenders. What, what they'll do is they'll, you know, they're like, yeah, we really work with people, you know, we, we're really consumer friendly. And so, you know, whenever someone is saying, hey, like, I don't have the money to pay it back right now, what they'll do is say like, it's okay, we'll, we'll let it roll into a separate loan, like, we'll take out this separate loan. So it's, it's like the question of them, you know, at some point, maybe it gets paid back, you know, but it is a much, much, much longer process and it is a much, much longer time than people had intended to and pay this back, which again, of course, re really, again, increases some of those fees, increases some of those costs, um, and really, again, traps people in some of those cycles of debt. Thanks so much, Andrea. I have a question for, uh, let's start with Nicole and then uh, Chris and Andrea, feel free um, to answer as well. But a lot of statistics that have been shared tonight are pre-pandemic, pre-COVID. Um, I'm assuming, I think we all assume that everything's just kind of worse uh, for folks who maybe were middle income, but now um, would be considered low income and then low income families that are still low income and probably experiencing um, more at the edge or now experiencing homelessness. But maybe Nicole, can you talk about the changes you might have seen um, with the, the families that you're serving or even more families? Yeah, we definitely have more people coming in and seeking support from us. Um, one thing that my team was able to do, which is awesome, is our case manager set up um, food deliveries to families that we, they did, I think every other week or so, they did, divided by region. Um, so that was super helpful to the families we work with. Um, but, you know, a lot of it, they're part of, you know, about access to things and stuff. It, it is challenging when everything is over telehealth, um, especially trying to seek like mental health and physical health services and our clients have less access to um, computers and uh, the smartphones and technology that they would need to access those services. So that definitely has declined um, in COVID. And then, like I mentioned, the access for kids um, and, and with food, uh, there's also um, concern that there was more domestic violence and child abuse that happened during COVID that went unreported without having the additional adults in children's life. Um, so I believe we'll see um, ramifications of that um, once things start opening up even more. Um, the hotlines and things for child abuse are already reporting increased reports um, now that kids are going back to school.
Thanks, Nicole. Uh, Andrea, Chris, did you want to add anything or? Okay. I, oh, sorry. Nope, I'm good. I'm just typing some answers to the other questions right now. Okay. You know, maybe, I, you know, I would just answer um, or just kind of respond. I think, you know, especially as we look at debt in Colorado, um, as a result in call in, of COVID, you know, we know that, you know, actually Colorado during COVID, you know, we, our state had the second highest percentage of our residents who took on debt during COVID to make ends meet, right? And we know that nationally, the number of folks who are living paycheck to paycheck, um, you know, increased pretty significantly kind of nationally during COVID. So, you know, um, I think that there was a, a comment in the chat um, about how this is a pretty depressing conversation and for that, I am really sorry. Um, but um, but but it is it is likely, especially from the folks who um, are often reliant on some of these different products, that there are you know that that their financial situation definitely did not improve as a result, you know, of of the pandemic. Thanks, Andrea. I have a question for you, Chris. Uh, what might be the mindset that led Colorado to create these regressive taxes? Well, good question. So again, you can't raise taxes without a vote of the people. So what, before you, you try to go run a campaign and buy a bunch of slots for the Broncos game to run your you know, vote yes on 3B thing, you do public polling. Um, Public polling says sales tax polls the best. People hate the gas tax. People hate property taxes. We're very reticent to raise, chase the income tax. But a lot of people think they can avoid sales taxes, or they they think that you know you have to actually buy something to then pay the sales tax. So maybe you can dodge them. So for any reason, one of those reasons, sales tax tend to poll a lot better. Also, the sales taxes most of them, the, the the numbers are from local sales tax. So again, I think Tabor sets up a situation where. People won't vote statewide to raise taxes, but they'll vote very locally. You know, I'll vote for a quarter sales tax to support my sheriff in Pueblo, but the hell with the rest of the state. And so I think it's a dynamic of kind of like uh, you, you, you can afford it, you get it mentality. But then that what I'm trying to make the link is and that exacerbates the regressive nature of our tax code is what what tends to be more politically palatable to get 51 percent of the vote tends to be more regressive. Thanks, Chris. I have one more for you. It's a little bit long, um, but I think it's a great follow-up. In November, we voted to raise the Denver sales tax by 0.25% in order to generate revenues to address homelessness. I supported the increase then and still do, says this person, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are given that you've said about the regressiveness of sales taxes. Yeah, there's pros and cons to raising revenue. I mean, you want to fund some, some things that drive our thriving communities like homeless you know, programs. That's you got to find a way to raise revenue. So a lot of times we get we have the trade-offs between sales versus property versus fees versus income tax. Um, one of the benefits of sales taxes is the way to get some money from tourists. We tend to be upper income people coming traveling from the state. So sales tax does, you know, gets about probably 20% of the revenue you're, you're bilking tourists who are visiting Denver. So that's one positive of the sales tax. Uh, another thing to need to know about local sales taxes, it depends what city or county, what they exempt. So a lot of ways to make it less regressive is to say, let's, let's exempt bread or let's exempt groceries or diapers or, or think necessities that, that low income folks have to buy. There's ways to make them less regressive. Um, but again, it's, it's, the economist says there's trade-offs, right? All sales tax are, gonna, are always gonna be regressive. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let's see, this is probably a question for Andrea. Would public banks be helpful in providing poor people fair access to credit? You know, I think that that is kind of an ongoing question. Um, you know, I think what I would also just add, you know, I think it again kind of goes back to some of the things had mentioned before, you know, is that I don't think necessarily, you know, sometimes I don't always necessarily think that there are, are always kind of new structures or new systems that, that always have to be in place to do some of this. You know, I think that often 
you know, through some of the things that we have going on that we can provide people with some of these um, who have some of these credit needs with better access to credit instead of doing that, um, you know, our, our um, you know, some of the kind of the community financial institutions who are charged with doing some of this are doing just amazing work in the community and are just doing, you know, wonderful work in trying to provide people with the lending um, support that they need. Um, so I think that, again, that's kind of an ongoing question. And I think that there are definitely um, uh, a lot to look in there. Um, but I, again, I also just think that there are a lot of great things that we currently have in the community to really tap into. And I think we have time probably just for one more question. Uh, I think this is probably going to be for Nicole. Um, Nicole, can you talk a little bit about food banks and, and food pantries, um, anywhere that folks can access uh, free food? Um, they tend to be pretty unhealthy uh, that folks are experiencing. What are those barriers to being able to access um, healthy food? Uh, for people that are needing to use uh, food pantries? Yeah, I think um, the biggest barrier, frankly, is that healthier food, like fresh vegetables and fruits and things expire pretty quickly. And so um, the lack of storage for those things, and then um, at, at the food bank or food pantry, the lack of refrigerated sections and things like that. And then just the fact that they go badly. A lot of things that come into the food banks are also donated foods. And so grocery stores don't generally donate fresh vegetables <laughs> to the food banks. And so, you know, just accessing those, having the food brought into the food pantries. Um, there are some nonprofits that are working on some things. When I was doing research for this presentation, there's a nonprofit um, working specifically in Montbello on trying to do some community gardening and make some food more um, accessible that way. And I think that those are popping up in other places. So people that live in these food deserts have the opportunity to participate in growing their own food and then get a share um, in the produce. And so that I think is a unique and exciting opportunity for some of our clients. And I love the creativity and, and thinking outside the box to provide healthy food to our families. Thanks, Nicole. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. This one is going to go to Chris. What is the difference between refundable and non-refundable EITC? Ooh, good wonky tax question. Uh, remember when um, Mitt Romney said 47% of Americans don't pay taxes? Or he said, what he actually said was 47% don't pay income taxes. This kind of goes back to kind of apropos to tax season right now. So you don't pay taxes, you don't pay your tax rates on all your income. When you, you sum up all your AGI, your adjusted gross income, and then you do all these deductions and the exemptions. Um, so like I deduct my you know, student loans and I deduct my mortgage interest and I deduct my charitable donations. Or, you know, you get deductions for, you used to get deductions for, for uh, kids and stuff. So you can have a situation where someone who has like earns $15,000 but then has $17,000 worth of deductions and whittles down their taxable income to less than zero. Well, so when you apply those tax rates, you have zero tax liability. So then you don't owe anything. And so most tax credits then take off what you owe. But if you already owe zero, some tax credits are designed to help those people who are already low income that they're already at zero tax liability. And we refund them. So we actually give them Instead of you owing a thousand and getting eight hundred dollar credit that makes you only owe two hundred, there are people who are maybe only owe two hundred, but then get that eight hundred dollars, it wipes them to zero, and then they get the extra six hundred back as a refundable tax credit. It's a way to make those those tax credits really valuable to the ones who are already at the zero zero liability mark. Thanks so much, Chris. And thank you so much to all of our panelists, Andrea, Nicole, and Chris tonight. Um, they will be sending their PowerPoints over to Meredith, who is going to be sending out an email later this week, um, kind of with some follow-up information that'll reiterate our call to action, which we'll get into in just a second. Um, and they'll have their PowerPoints and some like follow-up education that you can do as well on this topic. 
So I'm going to share my screen again. So tonight, our call to action is to participate in one of our advocacy action alerts. Uh, we're asking your senator, we're asking you to ask your senator to support SB 21242, uh, which will provide more housing resources for people experiencing homelessness. Meredith is going to be putting the link to the action alert in the chat, uh, but it's here on the screen as well. And I'll read off kind of what I wrote down so I don't forget anything about uh, 242. It's not calendared yet, uh, but will be heard in the Senate Local Government Committee soon. The bill will direct funding to rental assistance and renter support programs and expand the eligibility for these programs as well. It'll transfer $15 million from the general fund to the housing development grant. And it'll award grants uh, for the purchase of underutilized hotels, motels, and properties. So this is something that we are in support of and lobbying at the um, at the state capitol for this legislative session. So we'd love your help in getting all the senators to be on board with moving this forward. So thank you so much, everyone, for participating tonight, asking a lot of questions, and uh, hopefully participating in our action alert. Have a great night, everybody.